Anatomy of the State by Murray N. Rothbard Narrated by Harold Fritchie How the State Preserves Itself Once a state has been established, the problem of the ruling group or caste is how to maintain their rule. While force is their modus operandi, their basic and long-run problem is ideological. For in order to continue in office, any government, not simply a democratic government, must have the support of the majority of its subjects. This support, it must be noted, need not be active enthusiasm. It may well be passive resignation as if to an inevitable law of nature. But support in the sense of acceptance of some sort, it must be else the minority of state rulers would eventually be outweighed by the active resistance of the majority of the public. Since predation must be supported out of the surplus of production, it is necessarily true that the class constituting the state, the full-time bureaucracy and nobility, must be a rather small minority in the land, although it may, of course, purchase allies among important groups in the population. Therefore, the chief task of the rulers is always to secure the active or resigned acceptance of the majority of the citizens. Of course, one method of securing support is through the creation of vested economic interests. Therefore, the king alone cannot rule. He must have a sizable group of followers who enjoy the perquisites of rule. For example, the members of the state apparatus, such as the full-time bureaucracy or the established nobility. But this still secures only a minority of eager supporters, and even the essential purchasing of support by subsidies and other grants of privilege still does not obtain the consent of the majority. For this essential acceptance, the majority must be persuaded by ideology that their government is good, wise, and at least inevitable, and certainly better than any other conceivable alternatives. Promoting this ideology among the people is the vital social task of the intellectuals, for the masses of men do not create their own ideas or indeed think through these ideas independently. They follow passively the ideas adopted and disseminated by the body of intellectuals. The intellectuals are, therefore, the opinion molders in society, and since it is precisely a molding of opinion that the state most desperately needs, the basis for age-old alliance between the state and the intellectuals becomes clear. It is evident that the state needs the intellectuals. It is not so evident why intellectuals need the state. Put simply, we may state that the intellectual's livelihood in the free market is never too secure, for the intellectual must depend on the values and choices of the masses of his fellow men, and it is precisely characteristic of the masses that they are generally uninterested in intellectual matters. The state, on the other hand, is willing to offer the intellectuals a secure and permanent berth in the state apparatus, and thus a secure income and the panoply of prestige, for the intellectuals will be handsomely rewarded for the important function they perform for the state rulers, of which group they now become a part. The alliance between the state and the intellectuals was symbolized in the eager desire of professors at the University of Berlin in the 19th century to form the intellectual bodyguard of the House of Hohenzollern. In the present day, let us note the revealing comment of an eminent Marxist scholar concerning Professor Wittfogel's critical study of ancient Oriental despotism. Quote, the civilization which Professor Wittfogel is so bitterly attacking was one which could make poets and scholars into officials, unquote. Of innumerable examples, we may cite the recent development of the science of strategy in the service of the government's main violence-wielding arm, the military. A venerable institution, furthermore, is the official or court historian dedicated to purveying the ruler's view of their own and their predecessors' actions. Many and varied have been the arguments by which the state and its intellectuals have induced their subjects to support their rule. Basically, the strands of argument may be summed up as follows. a. The state rulers are great and wise men. They rule by divine right. They are the aristocracy of men. They are the scientific experts much greater and wiser than the good, 
but rather simple subjects, and b, rule by the extent government is inevitable, absolutely necessary, and far better than the indescribable evils that would ensue upon its downfall.